Good afternoon to everybody. Good morning uh, to those who are perhaps uh, not on European continent. Uh, so we have, uh, we're starting our traditional webinar uh, of the United for Ukraine Network. And uh, my name is Sergio Skubilius. I'm a member of European Parliament from Lithuania and also coordinator of, of that uh, parliamentary, interparliamentary network. And uh, today we are um, going to speak about uh, Western military support for Ukraine with very clear title together uh, until victory, Western military support for Ukraine. And uh, we have a brilliant panel of uh, experts and also of uh, those experts uh, uh, who produced recently very very interesting and very important papers on exactly on that topic. Uh, and that's uh, why really I, I hope that our conversation will be not only interesting, but also valuable looking into the future, what, you know, what is needed to be done. I published also several articles. So before going into, into the content, I want to remind everybody, you know, logistics. Our speakers will speak up to seven minutes. And uh, then we shall have possibility for Q&A session. Uh, all the discussion will go only in English, and those who want to raise a question should write them into the chat. And then we shall try uh, to share uh, uh, those questions among uh, speakers, uh, or you can name to whom you are addressing your, uh, your question. Now, what's uh, why we decided to have this, you know, webinar? Uh, I will tell my own story. You know, of course, uh, during all the last year, we were uh, looking with a lot of, you know, hopes that uh, Ukrainian uh, offensive operation will follow the same path that it was, uh, you know, at the end of 2022 with liberation of uh, Kharkov, of Kherson, also liberation of Kiev uh, uh, area. And as we understand, really, there were some successes in the sea, there were some successes, you know, uh, with a, a long range drone attacks, but on the ground, things were not moving as we were expecting. And definitely, you know, uh, everybody started to ask uh, the questions, what is the reason why it's going in such a way? the Western community supporting Ukraine, why Ukraine is not able to win. And at least my own experience was uh, very simple. At some time I asked myself, you know, the question, uh, so what is the reason, you know? Why, you know, the West, which is, uh, if you look into economical numbers, you know, uh, EU and the US, if you will add both of them, uh, and, to, and you will compare uh, the joint you know, economy with Russian economical potential, you will see the difference in 25 times. So how it comes, you know, that 25 times stronger community, which is, you know, declaring that we are helping Ukraine, is not able, you know, to, uh, to achieve the victory in a very, uh, how to say, effective way. And I look down into the numbers. And that uh, I, I, I discovered very, you know, from public sources, from Russian, international, Ukrainian sources, that Russia spent last year 100 billion euros for its military efforts on the front line, and even maybe more, because some data are not uh, open. It's not very clear if, if, if they include everything. Ukrainians, you know, spent from their budget around 40 billion, and then 40 billion they got from... Uh, from uh, Western, you know, as Western assistance. So for, in, in my, you know, in my calculations, it appears that Russians spent uh, 100 billion and another side, Ukraine together with all the Western assistance, managed to spend only around of 80 billion. Uh, well, maybe those numbers are not uh, precise, but in, in any case, it's clear that, you know, from, how do you say, from war finance side, it's, you know, uh, it's equal. I mean, our assistance till now was allowing Ukraine not to lose, but definitely we cannot see, you know, that uh, with such an assistance, Ukraine can prevail. And then I looked into, you know, how much of that spending uh, is, if to, 
uh, if you calculate it uh, as a percentage of GDP. So uh, according to official data, Russia is spending around 6% of its GDP. Uh, uh, Ukraine is spending around 25% of its GDP. And the whole military assistance from EU side, you know, both through peace facility and through member states, comes up only if you calculate one year, for two years, 0.15% of the whole EU GDP. For one year, it's 0.075%. Americans are a little bit better. For two years, they spend 0.20. For one year, 0.10. But you know, again, this is the numbers which, how to say, 0 0.075, really it's, it's not what we should be happy, you know, when we are looking into those numbers. Of course, there is big difference among different countries. Estonia and Lithuania are spending around 1.4% during those two years. Norway, perhaps 0 0.9. Germans are catching up 0 0.5. But France, 0.02%. So this is the reality. The question is why we are, you know, not giving more of our support to Ukraine. And here, you know, my, my answer was, you know, mm, moving into two directions. One is our physical capacities, at least in Lithuania, and I think the same with Estonia. At the very beginning, we gave everything what we had in our, you know, reserves in our stocks. And, you know, and now our reserves are empty and our production capabilities to produce anything of a value for Ukraine is quite limited. Maybe the same is with some other European countries. And here is what Estonian paper really was very good in, in, in describing what are, what are the issues, what are the challenges. So one thing is really physical production capacity of you know, especially European military uh, industry, which needs to be raised as quickly as possible. Second is, of course, political issue, political, you know, question of political will. Because, uh, again, what we are facing is that some countries are, you know, they, they feel the fear of escalation if they are giving some kind of, you know, long range missiles, you know, more effective weapons that it, you know that Putin can escalate the war, and second, what I see also as a problem that in some countries uh, there is a fear what will happen with Russia if Ukraine is winning, uh, Putin regime is collapsing, who will come next, and that you know is is some kind of fear that this can bring uh, total unpredictable situation, and and that is why maybe some some countries are also hesitating to give. Uh, enough of weapons to, to Ukraine. So this is my, my views. You know, I was trying to describe very, very briefly how I see the situation. And uh, what we are trying here in the European Parliament also to push our discussions to more, you know, clear vision how those issues could be resolved, how we can increase our support in order really um, uh, to help Ukraine not only to uh, not to lose the war, but also to win the war. When it will can come, how it will come, it can come, or like you know, and do we have a clear plan? Like uh, United States uh, Congress Republicans recently published important uh, important paper, important statement where they demanded from administration clear uh, victory plan. So those are the issues which I hope we shall be able today um, uh, to discuss in a more detail. And my pleasure and honor, first of all, to ask uh, our Estonian colleague, uh, uh, Christian Meyer, uh, um, uh, whose position is uh, his director, or, uh, and he leads policy planning department in the Ministry of Defense of the Republic of Estonia. And he's one of the courses of the strategy paper, which I mentioned, uh, but uh, uh, which um, it has a title setting transatlantic defense up for success a military strategy for ukraine's victory and russia's defeat with a very good title uh, you can find that uh, you know uh, paper either on invitation to our webinar or on the uh, web page of the ministry and i 
can praise uh, even before uh, Christian will speak. Really, it's a very impressive paper, you know, and it made at least on 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 my thinking uh, quite a strong influence. So, Christian, please go on. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for the uh, warm words. Uh, I can wholeheartedly say that I was not the only author. So, uh, but thank you for the uh, for the kind words. Thank you for the kind invitation today. Uh, I hope uh, indeed that everyone has had access to that paper, and uh, if you've uh, liked that paper, if you've read that paper, that you've also shared that paper, um, uh, in order to to have this very uh, discussion that we are having today. I doubt there are many people amongst uh, this uh, video conference today who I have to really convince uh, of what we have to do. But I would I would still give some. Uh, some remarks uh, that uh, that perhaps help to explain why we wrote the paper as well, and and uh, and the framework into which this this discussion paper really uh, really lands. Um, obviously, uh, as an Estonian, as a defense official, um, as a reservist of the Estonian Defense Forces, and so forth, I, I'm I'm proud of you know what Estonia uh, as a nation has done. Uh, in support of uh, Ukraine, not just in terms of military assistance, but really providing military assistance uh, when perhaps other allies and partners were not so keen on providing uh, military assistance. And obviously our Baltic uh, colleagues here were right beside us as well when we were donating javelins. Uh, whether it was the Tallinn Pledge last year that helped to kind of uh, open up the floodgates for uh, tanks and, and so forth, uh, and uh, actually, at the beginning of last year, the Ministry of Defense also released a similar paper that kind of kicked off this whole series that addressed the uh, Russian uh, or the overall war myths in that regard. So if you haven't read that paper, that is also that can also be found on the on the MOD web page. Almost all of its conclusions still remain relevant some 13 months uh, later um, as well. And obviously, the one million round initiative. So, Overall, what I'm trying to say is um, Estonia has definitely felt the need to be at the uh, at the front foot of thinking uh, about the war in Ukraine as well, and what can what is necessary to be uh, done. Um, and obviously, recently we just had President Zelensky's uh, visit uh, to the Baltic uh, states uh, as well, and. Uh, he was also inspired uh, by that uh, by the paper and by some of its conclusions and, and proposals in, in that regard. So why we got to this paper? Um, you know, those of us who live in the northern hemisphere here uh, understand that the doom and gloom in the middle of December and the January is is omnipresent. Uh, but overall, it felt like this doom and gloom was overwhelming uh, and it was only increasing. Uh, no fresh ideas. Uh, challenges, uh, disputes on both sides of the Atlantic uh, when it comes to the continuation of the assistance. Uh, the 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 public, perhaps, uh, you know, always the that concern of perhaps a little bit of a war fatigue. That rhetoric uh, had uh, become more uh, quantitatively uh, visible, uh, and also, and I guess that's the most important part. Uh, we tried to put on the paper something uh, to prove uh, that the war in Ukraine is winnable. It is doable, it is sustainable, and uh, all of you who have participated uh, in various discussions over the past two years in whatever conferences and so forth, how many times have there been uh, statements that we don't know what the strategy is or we don't have a strategy and so forth. So we we try to fill that void and it's not very common uh, for uh, government uh, offices to put out such a paper, uh, but we clearly have felt the need to do that. Uh, and obviously uh, by doing that paper, we did not want to undermine for one second any of the war effort uh, that Ukraine uh, is in. So as much as possible, we were, of course, relying on all available uh, open source information, just trying to really bring it together 
and uh, and add some credibility uh, to those numbers uh, by having those presented not by a think tank, but by a, a ministry of defense. Um, so that's that's the overall context, the framework why we uh, decided to do the paper, and I would say the backdrop. Uh, for the overall reason why we need this strategy, why we need Ukraine to win and Russia to lose is also very clear. Uh, if I have to sum up in some four, five, six points why this strategy is so relevant, why this victory is so relevant is uh, because for the past 20 years, uh, to a large degree, we have collectively, uh, misunderstood uh, and underestimated Russia's strategic intent. Uh, from the early 2000s to the war in Georgia, Crimea, Syria, uh, up to the uh, 24th February 2022, it's been a uh, continuous uh, underestimation of how Russia sees the world and what their strategic intent is. Uh, and this and this has occurred despite the fact that Putin has been extremely consistent on his message throughout this period. So a series of miscalculations. Then it's been a 20 years of, of an effort as NATO allies uh, to convince the NATO alliance that collective defense is the core business of NATO. Uh, NATO is now dealing with collective defense but we are now seeing uh, the capacity challenges that the Alliance has and that it is addressing uh, honestly. Uh, it has been 30 years of underinvestments into defense. Uh, only 30% of NATO allies meet the minimum requirement of investing at least 2% into defense. And this in return has led to all of the underinvestments, under orders, uh, to our uh, transatlantic European uh, defense industry uh, uh, production. Uh, additionally, uh, what we are seeing uh, as a negative trend is the uh, the announcement by Defense Minister Shoigu uh, on the increase of Russia's military forces by 50%. Uh, and when it comes to the actual force posture increase uh, behind the Baltic states, you know, we're talking about two to three times increase in that military posture. Where there have not been brigades, there will be brigades. Where there have been brigades, those brigades will be turned into divisions. And uh, Finland now has uh, is welcoming a new uh, army corps behind its border. So these developments are already taking place. Uh, these underestimations and ridiculing of Russia's defense industry uh, that were very omnipresent, uh, I'd say, at least for a year and a half, have since dissipated, have, been dis have disappeared almost entirely. And now everyone recognizes that Russia has actually switched to wartime economy. It is actually succeeding in increasing its uh, its military uh, industry output, particularly when it comes to uh, ammunition. Uh, so, and I'm not even mentioning the global uh, situation uh, in various theaters uh, outside of Europe as well. So the overall context is concerning to say the least. And, uh, and Ukraine ties into all of that one way or another. Because for the first time in, in 30 years, uh, we're seeing how uh, all the, the key actors globally, both state and non-state actors, are essentially interconnected to the various conflicts and wars that are ongoing uh, at this very moment. And this is unprecedented uh, in our contemporary history in that regard. And that puts a tremendous demand uh, on our defense forces and on the military tool of instrument. Unfortunately, it is needed almost everywhere and the need is only increasing. Uh, and again, it ties to uh, the war in Ukraine as well. Uh, to sum up my initial remarks, 
I would just say that we have presented a lot of numbers and a lot of lines of efforts that our collective strategy should be focusing on. I have no doubt that in almost any allied country, in almost any Ministry of Defense, uh, you can find uh, people in uniform and outside of uniform who deal with defense policy who could write a similar uh, paper and are thinking about those exact same things. I don't doubt that for a second. Uh, so uh, whether all these numbers are precise, uh, you know, because we are relying in a lot of cases on open source information and so forth, and we do not want to weaken Ukraine's position, but the bottom line message is that despite all of our efforts, political, economic, informational, uh, military security assistance, uh, in various formats, uh, be it the Rammstein coalition format, be it the European Union at the council level, be it NATO, be it G7, be it Quad, and so forth. There has not been a single meeting that would bring at the leaders level all of those who support Ukraine together. This is something that we did uh, when it uh, came to the war in Afghanistan. Uh, we have not done that with uh, Ukraine. And so that would be something new, something different. It is something that would undeniably communicate to the Russians uh, that we are indeed in it for the long term, uh, that this issue is addressed at the leaders level. And it is only the leaders who can take such a commitment, that being 0.25% of GDP, uh, uh, of military assistance to Ukraine. This can only be taken by the leaders. This cannot be taken by defense ministers, foreign ministers, and so forth. It needs to be done at the leaders' level, and it needs to be also done at the leaders' level uh, to, first of all, to inspire other leaders, because there are already a lot of allies, a lot of European nations, who have not perhaps framed their commitment in such a way, but are committing that amount of money or have committed this amount of money for the long term. So these nations are already there. Uh, so there is a bit of a, a peer pressure uh, that this could bring about. But it is also uh, it will also allow an equitable share of risks as well. Because if we know that each and every country of that coalition is willing to commit that amount of resources, uh, it perhaps uh, lowers the risk uh, for, let's say, for the Baltic states or for Poland or some other Eastern flank countries to donate even more because we know that the investments are coming up and because investments are coming up, the defense production is coming up. So the idea is, is, is pretty simple in, in that regard and uh, it will make uh, a difference. And then we can you know, uh, adjust the strategy as well and uh, go into more uh, specifics because, you know, there's a number of lines of efforts uh, and a lot of capabilities that Ukraine needs and so forth. Uh, but this is a much easier discussion to be had. Currently, we need leadership and we need resources. And the military strategy, you know, this can always be adjusted. Uh, thank you so much. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Christian. Uh... But a but a but a uh, good and and uh, impressive presentation, and uh, I got that inspiration, you know, on zero point twenty five uh, percent of GDP. Uh, I said we need to have such a coalition. I spoke that also in in European Parliament, you know, and uh, we shall continue because for us, uh, I, I understand very simply. You know, if now EU support for as as I calculated, you know, for the last year was zero point zero seventy five, so going up to zero point twenty five, it would mean you know three times bigger, uh, you know, military support to Ukraine from our side, which you know would bring really change on 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 the ground. You know, that's that's what what we can predict. But okay, good. So that's that's one paper which really is, is very impressive. Now we are moving to another paper, and, uh, uh, and that is a paper which is produced uh, 
uh, both by, as I understand, by Ukrainian and Canadian experts. And we have uh, Ariana Gitz, uh, if I am correctly pronouncing, uh, political and legal analyst, uh, director of Direct In Initiative International Center for Ukraine from Canada. And uh, uh, and again, you can uh, have uh, the link to the interesting and important paper, Western Policy for Russia Strategic Defeat. Ariana, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, I will begin with my legal position on the Russia-Ukraine war because it is the starting point for devising any strategy to bring the war to an end. Russia started waging its unprovoked, undeclared, illegal, and genocidal war of aggression against Ukraine in February 2014. And this triggered legal consequences, not just for Russia, but also for Ukraine and the international community. Ukraine received the legal right of individual self-defense, which allows it to strike any target on Russian territory which doesn't violate international humanitarian law, and any target on the territory of any country helping Russia wage its illegal aggression, be it Belarus, Iran, North Korea, or even China. The international community has four main legal obligations arising from this. One, not to assist Russia's aggression. Two, not to give validity to any Russian gains from the war. Three, to cooperate to bring Russia's aggression to an end. And this includes any and all military assistance to Ukraine and economic sanctions on Russia. And let's be clear, no country has any obligation to Russia to limit their military assistance to Ukraine. The West should not be withholding weapons that would allow Ukraine to match those used by Russia. And the West should not be restraining Ukraine's right to use Western supplied weapons to hit targets on Russian territory. Sanctions must be structured in a way to induce Russia to halt aggression. The current regime of individual and sectoral sanctions, I'm sorry to say, is pathetic. We can no longer tolerate a situation where global peace is sacrificed to profits of unscrupulous businesses who enable the Russian criminal state. We must impose a full economic embargo on Russia. Uh, fourthly, the international community is obligated to cooperate to bring Russia to responsibility for its criminal actions, including for the crimes of aggression and genocide. Western governments must cooperate to create a special international tribunal for Russia's aggression and lead the way of recognizing Russian genocide against Ukrainians. Uh, but most importantly, every state in the world has the legal right to fight alongside Ukraine in collective self-defense at Ukraine's request. While Kyiv hasn't officially made such a request, we all know it's not because Ukraine doesn't want such help. Countries of the free world are hiding behind their membership in NATO to avoid their own individual responsibility for protecting international peace and security. And let me emphasize, Russia's war against Ukraine is an attack on the whole international community. Russian genocide against Ukrainians is an attack on the whole of humanity. We need to acknowledge that it isn't just Russian aggression, but also Western inaction, which is responsible for dismantling the post-World War II global security architecture. And as a result, we're witnessing the growing threat of the global axis of terror led by Moscow and backed by Beijing. Russia's aggressive criminal state is the main threat to international peace and security, and it must be removed. Moscow's ideology of Russism is our joint problem. The lack of justice for Russian crimes around the world is a challenge for all of us. And that's why merely helping Ukraine is not enough. We must be seeking Russia's strategic defeat together with Ukraine. Solutions that could have potentially worked in 2014 are absolutely insufficient today. If the objective in 2024 is to put Ukraine in a position of strength at the negotiating table with Russia, we've already lost. Um, even formally, this war can end only if the Russian government annuls all illegal acts of the Russian government violating Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, including revising their constitution. Ukraine simply cannot achieve that single-handedly on the current terms of Western support. Sustainable peace in Ukraine is possible only, sorry, not just in Ukraine, but in Europe. It's possible only if Russia is crushingly defeated. 
However, the Western political record is stuck on repeat, that it should be Ukrainians to defeat Russia. And um, I'll be very blunt, the approach isn't just immoral, but it's also self-defeating. It invites Russian aggression against other countries, including NATO nations. Putin is itching to show that NATO is ineffective. And I don't believe he's going to wait for Russia to be weakened or for NATO to jumpstart its military production. We can be certain that Moscow is preparing a special operation against a NATO member as part of its strategy of escalating to de-escalate. And I am afraid that we have very good reasons to believe that Western powers will make concessions if faced with a serious threat from Russia. Western posturing right now can be read more like an invitation than a deterrent, which is highly problematic. The Western response to Russian aggression is premised on the fear of nuclear attack. If Ukraine had relied on that same position, there would be no Ukraine now. So it's time for Western nations to pursue more forceful policies than just sending help to Ukraine. To start, Ukraine should be free of any constraints of using Western weapons against valid targets in Russian territory. Ukraine should be given access to all Western-made missiles, which match the distance ranges used by Russia. Western nations must implement a humanitarian military mission to protect critical civilian and nuclear infrastructure in Ukraine. Such a mission doesn't even face direct combat with Russians, but it will help Ukrainians free up resources and send a resolute signal to Russia. There must be a coalition of the willing for joint air defense of Ukraine and NATO. The risks for NATO are low, protecting from Russian missiles, which have absolutely no business being in Ukrainian skies, will not even result in attacking Russian nationals. Ukraine and its NATO neighbors could launch joint patrolling of the border regions, and uh, Ukraine must be invited to join and be given imminent membership at the NATO summit in Washington. I like to frame it this way. We understood that the Allies defeated Nazi Germany because there was no peace or security without German defeat. Uh, the same holds true today with fascist Russia. There can be no peace or security, not only in Ukraine, but in Europe and quite frankly, the Western world without Russian military and political defeat. Um, uh, to be honest, if it were up to me, NATO would already be fighting alongside Ukraine rather than doing its best to avoid doing so. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thanks a lot for you know, this uh, good overview of political you know, side of, uh, of the Western uh, uh, support to Ukraine. Where are really big challenges? How the West understands its aim in the war, and uh, and uh, what they are worried about or afraid of? That is okay. uh, again part of of the whole of the whole challenge. Now uh, it's my pleasure to invite Lina Slinkiewicz, who's um, uh, representative of uh, European institutions, deputy head of chief executive policy office. In European Defense Agency, and Lina Slinkiewicz uh, is present with us. He is not a former minister, the Foreign Affairs Minister of Lithuania, who, who had the same name. So, but uh, it's a pleasure to have Lina uh, with us. So, please. Thank you, thank you so much, and Sliki Malon Gutkartu. Well, <clears throat> indeed, my name always creates some uh, some uh, associations. But in fact, I have some very close relations with uh, another Lina, so it's not by chance. <laughs> um, so uh, first, uh, let me thank you also for invitation. And Yirji uh, Shedivi, uh, he apologizes that he couldn't make it, but he uh, saw it immense importance that also institutions and EDA is present and that we can also deliver uh, information and to report what we do in terms of the, uh, as we say, deeds not talking. Uh, I will leave uh, some um, political assessments aside because I represent uh, institutions, but also in the Q&A part, of course, I would be happy to take questions and to get into the, into this di discussion. Uh, <clears throat> so indeed, uh, the success of EU, EU defense uh, initiatives and overall cooperation on security and defense at EU level is being <clears throat> and will be assessed uh, looking at how Euro-Atlantic community was able to support Ukraine politically, economically, but also, of course, more important, uh, militarily. And also how effective uh, and fast and defense industry was able to adapt and uh, supply the needed products for, to the stock for member states, but also for, for Ukraine. 
But now the work is ongoing and it's very important to highlight. So we don't have time in a way to now dive into the lessons learned because there is no time. Winter is here. We also observe the mobilization of additional forces, uh, armed forces of Russia, uh, closer to the border. So another offense also from the other side. So we have to act swiftly and uh, with confidence. <clears throat> and also, uh, of course, um, I hear very well what you, Chair, just also said that indeed the, the, the figures are not very satisfying, maybe, or that those that we expected all, considering the capacity of your member states, uh, economical, but also military capacity. But also there's a fact that there is a big lack of transparency among member states that they do not report <clears throat> uh, many figures. And I don't know why. This is also that we can discuss, I believe. And just for your information, also last week, uh, EU, European Union institutions sent another <clears throat> letter uh, to ministers of defense of EU member states to report on all the support provided to Ukraine so far, but also the plans to procure and to deliver to Ukraine <clears throat> in the coming future. So <clears throat> this is a challenge, at least for us, for institutions also to have the full, complete picture, uh, which helps also for the planning, for political discussions, and uh, as you know, also ministers of defense are meeting on the 31st of January, <clears throat> so next week, and they will be discussing also the progress on uh, how we managed to achieve the delivery of 155 am ammunition uh, to Ukraine. I will come to this in a second, in a moment, but just before that, just to say that indeed communication is important. And we are not very good at that at the EU level. We also have to acknowledge that. Uh, but also we know what Ukraine needs. We have very close contacts with them, with officials, at different levels, and also what is clear is that for sure, and it was mentioned by many colleagues, that uh, air defense, uh, more artillery ammunition, more guns, uh, also of course winter and the soldier equipment as such, those three elements. And uh, and actually EDA, just right after the outbreak of the war, uh, Ukraine, Russia, uh, we invited all member states to use our framework <coughs> and to, <coughs> to make full use of our legal basis, experience, expertise, and explore opportunities for conducting joint procurement. And maybe you know already that we launched uh, immediately three new projects <clears throat> for ammunition, uh, CBRN equipment, and soldier equipment, uh, which are for seven, eight years. But of course, it is too late. So then we focus mainly on the fast track initiative, so called uh, fast track to procure immediately 155 ammunition or to help to procure the embassies which have capacity and money to do so together through it, through European Union. And I will come to, as I mentioned in a moment. We also offer to member states uh, the existing framework contracts in EDA. Uh, for instance, the uh, contracted commercial services uh, that can be used by member states or our partner countries like Ukraine. And just I, why I'm mentioning this is not just for theories because those contracts are still in force and active and they can be used by member states and also by Ukraine today. Uh, for instance, one of the most successful ones is a EU satellite communication uh, project, which has around 36 participating uh, members, including all, all EU member states. And Ukraine also is a member, by the way, of uh, has an agreement with uh, <coughs> EDA. So in theory, they also could be considered participating in this. What it offers, it offers these uh, satellite services, communication information system, uh, which are interconnectable with the Starlink and uh, one web, which is British uh, satellites. And speaking about the financial terms, uh, this contract is up to 250 million euro uh, ceiling, uh, but remaining capacity is now for 150 million. It is today now, so if you're purchasing certain devices, tools, and services, which are expensive to use, uh, it's possible to do it now. We called a uh, number of meetings with member states last year also to encourage them to use these uh, framework contracts. Uh, we haven't received yet interest, expression of interest from them, but just to inform you that there are certain tools also available uh, that are not yet used to, to, to the full extent. Also, the, for instance, Ukrainian helicopter um, pilots could be also trained um, in the newly established multinational helicopter training center in Sintra in Portugal, which was uh, created together with EDA last year. And this is another example. 
Now, let me go to the 155 ammunition, which is the most important uh, project right now, and also politically. <clears throat> so um, we continue on the three-track ammunition initiative uh, together with commission, EAS, and military staff. And under the track one and two, uh, by March this year, uh, we expect to reach already uh, around 500,000 pieces of ammunition, uh, which were already delivered to Ukraine, uh, almost half, half a million. And by the end of this year, uh, this number uh, may increase by 200,000 more. Also under track three, which was uh, more for commission to implement and related to the ramp up of industrial capacities, as you have heard probably that also ASAP, so-called ASAP, the initiative for, um, to support industry to ramp up the production capacity is already ongoing. And the calls for proposals from industry was a deadline 13 of December. And uh, also the, the selection process and commission is now ongoing and the commission announced that by, by the end of the first quarter this year, they will already announce about the first grant uh, to some consortia or industry which will be using this money to increase the industrial capacity. Also at DIRPA, it's, it's still uh, in the pipe, but uh, earlier by summer will be active. And now also another very important work that we're doing together and along with the commission and EAS uh, drafting the so-called European Defense Industrial Strategy. And I'm also a member of this um, small task force that we are trying to define this uh, very important text, which will be used for next 10, 15 years. And which will also result in the so-called uh, European Defense Investment Program uh, led by commission and uh, DG DEFIS for the next uh, also MFF period. Uh, those things are coming. It's too far away, speaking about uh, what is happening now. So let me now come back to the, uh, the uh, procurement of 155 ammunition and um, provide you the update where we, have, where we stand right now. So as you know, the EDA's fast track project for ammunition <clears throat> was launched last year uh, for to covering all up rounds and four different uh, elements, uh, which are fuses, projectile charges, and primers. Why I'm mentioning this? Because this is very important. It's a specific ammunition type, probably the only one because of the size, which is made of uh, different elements, which are assembled on the field, on the fighting battlefield. So they are even transported uh, in different pieces because it's dangerous, but also the soldier decides how far he wants to shoot and uh, at what distance. And again, there are some precision um, uh, technologies to, to be adapted which means that also we uh, had to approach much wider market in the European Union that we expected. So it's not like focusing on four big primes and producers in Europe. So uh, after um, reaching out to the European industry, we received uh, responses, over 200 different answers and responses from industry from over 20 different companies, which makes things complicated, but at the same time increases opportunities and possibilities for member states to combine different options for procurement. And we hear also from Ukrainian defense ministers and the deputy defense ministers discussions in the EU context or Ukraine defense contact group at NATO, that they need everything, including uh, not only full uh, package, so-called all up round, but also different elements that they can combine in different companies and then to use on the field. Um, well, so actually in the EDA's uh, project arrangement, we focus mainly on four different modern uh, fighting systems uh, commonly used by Ukrainians in, in, in the battlefield. So uh, German Panzer Haubitz 2000, French Caesar and Polish Krat and Slovakian Suzanne. Um, so what we did is just that we allowed a simplified tendering process. Uh, we finalized the, the, the procurement process in six months. So starting from the signature of the project arrangement until the uh, signature already of the frame first framework contract, it took six months, which is record uh, time. Uh, and we, as I mentioned, approached uh, European defense industry and Norway. Um, before the deadline, because you know that was very much linked also to the reimbursement scheme offered by European Peace Facility uh, for track two, one billion euro was, um, was allocated or dedicated. So we managed to sign nine framework contracts before 30th of September last year, 
allowing those member, member states which are interested to procure ammunition and to get reimbursed by 50 or 60% uh, reimbursement rate. Uh, so seven countries, seven EU member states placed orders uh, by 30th of September last year. Um, but work didn't stop there. We continued to also exploring the market and we uh, now reached even the number of 60 framework contracts as of today. Uh, which is a much bigger number, offering much more opportunities for member states now to procure 155 combination. Um, also, what is important that these uh, framework contracts and the procurements are also uh, eligible or um, compatible with uh, commissions instruments like ADIRPA, ASAP, and uh, other which are in the pipe. Uh, so my main message is now speaking about the, as I said in the beginning, the deeds and actions is that indeed we can speak a lot about the industrial capacity, about member states capacity, but there are certain facts that are also clear that um, industrial capacity to deliver in Europe is still there. It's not fully used. So member states are really invited to place orders and to procure uh, ammunition or other capabilities. Uh, why I say so, because we also have, of course, um, uh, direct contacts with industry, but industry are also commercial actors. They are not disclosing all information to media or also to institutions uh, before they get signatures on the contracts, before they get also commitment from the clients to procure certain ammunition. So they need clear uh, commitment from, from countries. Now, within the contracts I mentioned, 60 framework contracts that the DA managed to negotiate and sign, Currently, there is unused capacity to procure hundreds of thousands of projectiles, charges, and even uh, all up rounds of ammunition, which are pending. What it means that it means that member states can place orders now and can expect to receive these uh, ammunition, uh, ammunition at the best, in the best case scenario by the end of this year, but most probably next year, because it takes time for industry to produce. This is the reality. So earlier we place order or member states place order, earlier we can expect to receive and earlier we can expect to deliver to Ukraine. And this is really, this is the re reality today. <clears throat> uh, in financial terms, uh, about speaking about at least EDA's uh, remaining financial envelope, uh, it is up to 2 billion euro, which is possible uh, to use the, within the current framework contracts. Um, but again, we have to keep in mind that the demand in the in the world in the world market, but also European market, is very high. Uh, we see what is happening in Palestine, and also that also even the United States are placing orders in in Europe and are procuring from European companies. So there is, there is no kind of competition as such, but simply the market is life is lively, and uh, there are many clients around the world which are also not in competition, but at least in queue. They're queuing for the same ammunition type. So member states are really encouraged to, 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 to play as active as possible. And again, placing orders today, it means that you will get at the earliest in 12 months. This is the production capacity of, of, of industry. Uh, I stop here and I uh, will be happy to, to also discuss in the Q&A and uh, to take some questions if any. Thanks a lot. Okay, Lina, thanks a lot. Uh, really very valuable information. Before I will ask Urmas uh, Rensolo to jump in, I would uh, suggest to speakers to look into the chat. Uh, now uh, I see you know, some uh, uh, questions, you know, and uh, and uh, and also you know congratulations. Uh, our good friend Anna Maria uh, Corasa built sends all the best regards to Christian uh, for good paper. But also there are questions from uh, our, our good friend Roland Ronestein and also from John Bowis uh, from United Kingdom, which, are, which covers perhaps everything, <laughs> what, you know, what, uh, what we want to discuss. So please look, uh, you know, uh, and I think that uh, we shall have really a very interesting debate after. Urmas Rensolo, uh, our, you know, friend from uh, old days, uh, I would call so, you know, minister, uh, former minister in Estonia of everything. I don't know, I, I am 
I, uh, not to make mistake, you know, for for my foreign affairs minister, that was the last uh, position. Before that, minister of defense. Uh, at some time, minister of justice, if I am <laughs> correct. Now, uh, active member of uh, and leader of uh, opposition in Rikigogo, but also member of our uh, steering committee of our network. So, Urmas, please, floor is yours. Hello to everybody. Uh, I think uh, the most uh, important uh, currently is to understand that we are in a very critical crossroad. And there is a dramatic need to a paradigmatic shift to military Ukraine, uh, uh, military aid to Ukraine. I remember it was, uh, I think, 20, 20, uh, 22 uh, April. I wrote an, a report of the urgent military need to Ukraine, and I put out that the urgent military need would be a plus hundred uh, billion dollars, and uh, called also to rise to European peace facility to fifty billions. So the one thing is we have to assess that the war is very costly thing, and secondly we have to assess that this is. Uh, still not anything unique in the modern history of uh, Western countries' participation to military efforts outside their country. If I compare, for example, uh, an annual U.S. military support to Ukraine, what they have given now during the course of two years, so it is still uh, in a ratio to the uh, GDP to U.S., 13 times less than Korean War, five times less than Vietnam, and three times less than annual contribution to Iraq. And um, in that context, we have to admit that uh, there is a current uh, a need and deficit of ammunition, but also speaking of the uh, heavy weaponry systems. So uh, if we compare now a... Um, Russian pre-war military system uh, reserves and NATO countries combined reserves. Then, for example, if uh, comparison to tanks, 18,000 NATO countries and uh, Russia, 3,400, uh, we have uh, still uh, during the two years given less than 5% of pledges to the combined uh, reserves of tanks of NATO countries. So also uh, looking to the, Andreas gave some uh, figures on the, uh, on the combined EU effort, to the military aid uh, during this uh, last year. So if Europe, if the political leaders will consider what is a central uh, political crisis, there will be also a deliver. We, I, I, I just put to the perspective uh, the uh, figures what mentioned uh, Andrews, and uh, remember that during the European financial crisis, uh, the amount of loans given to four uh, European countries was almost half a trillion of euros. The, if we are speaking about the coronavirus, then Corona Recovery Facility was more than 800 billion euros. So what I'm saying is that uh, if we take it as a central political crisis, then we will we should also deliver. The, the, the amounts are far less in the modern uh, warfare history uh, when what uh, Western countries have delivered during two years. And secondly, they are still very minimal, looking to the effort what European Union in a centralized manner has put to the issues what have then politically considered to be a central crisis to be solved. This is, I think, the, of the utmost importance. Now, why I, I just quote uh, Mark Kantian, a uh, analytic of, uh, of uh, security, uh, International Security Institute, and he answers a question. 
what will be the effect of reductions in military aid, aid to Ukraine? And let me quote, reductions in military aid, and this is a, a rather fresh report written end of uh, December, will cause the Ukrainian military to gradually lose combat power. Already Ukraine has lost the ability to conduct counter offensives. By early spring, even local counterattacks will be difficult. Ukrainian cities will suffer more destruction as air defenses weaken and more Russian missiles get through. By early summer, Ukraine will be hard pressed to hold back Russian attacks. Eventually, its front will crack and the Russians will make major territorial gains. Complete collapse might follow. End of quote. So this is a one analytical perspective to the uh, dark scenario. If Western countries would fail, and so the victory of Ukraine or the victory of Putin regime is actually in the, our hands or literally in the hands of leaders of our capitals. And uh, I, I think the most uh, dramatic is now the situation with uh, US military uh, aid. So uh, if we look to the presidential drawdown authority, which is the central uh, channel of uh, US military aid, so a decline in commitments began in August as funding started to run out and PDA transfers uh, ending the last year were about one fifth of the previous average level, not the level what was uh, in a support uh, of uh, in the peak level of supporting the counteroffensive in last uh, spring. So if U.S. will basically um, fail to deliver, and so this is their uh, political, domestic political issue now. But the reality is that uh, the deliveries will increase slightly, and uh, in this, uh, and it will be the bottom will be in the spring uh, of uh, this year. Is about twelve percent of the previous level. So we are running out uh, the uh, literally of U.S. military support. And what needs to be done uh, now badly? The one thing is in treat uh, Estonians uh, call to uh, one uh, zero point twenty five percent of GDP to military support. The element of country or the basis of countries how they are making their pledges is now. I hope there will be a smooth uh, additional countries will join the first country who co-signed. Uh, uh, a security guarantees compact, which also included this year military aid to Ukraine, was UK. The Rishi Sunak visited uh, Kiev. He made his pledge, but what was his pledge? UK has given military support, and uh, UK has proudly been one of the most uh, uh, paramount uh, leaders of the military aid to uh, Ukraine. 22, the figures were 230 uh, billion uh, e pounds. So this is around 0.08% of their national GDP. They repeated basically the same achievement last year. And for the, this year, the pledge what UK made uh, under this uh, um, treaty is 2.5 uh, billion uh, pounds then uh, of support to uh, Ukraine, military support. So this is far less what by this pledge, uh, uh, what Christian mentioned earlier, uh, uh, is actually being delivered. So we need truly to make a pledge that uh, we, if we believe that this is not a sidebar exercise or side uh, issue, so there needs to be a new level new, uh, and change of paradig paradigma uh, to the military aid to uh, Ukraine. And this is, we are speaking truly of the uh, effort of uh, hundreds of billions of euros to show also, to, to, to work their readiness to, to deliver it is also a central uh, deterrence against uh, Russia, I believe. So my call truly is that uh, we do have uh, European stability mechanism, which is not opened. A moment we can use it. It it has, uh, it could be have active uh, 
up to the 500 uh, billion euros to use as a as a as a loan scheme guaranteed by then uh, members of uh, uh, of uh, member states and um, this is something uh, i make i end there thank you thanks a lot Urmas. so uh, that is where you know we finished uh, the speaker's line uh, some of our Invited speakers were not able to show, but we shall uh, have good uh, time for uh, broader discussion. And uh, questions are coming, you know, and really very serious questions. So I hope that speakers are looking into the chat and you can pick, you know, uh, what questions you want to answer. But uh, I see uh, several questions which are repeating, you know, uh, as I said before, from several, you know, well-known uh, friends from our community but also some new are coming and uh, those questions are you know in similar way asking the same strategic question how to convince uh, those countries from the western democracy community which are still not matching the highest level of uh, you know support to ukraine so in general that is a question and uh, maybe I am looking to uh, Christian, first of all, can you elaborate a little bit what and how you, for example, how, okay, you proposed a very good idea, which uh, I said before, I picked it, you know, and I'm trying to go around to, 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 to speak out, you know, on uh, what I call coalition of, you know, 0.25% of GDP. So how it, how it goes, how you are convincing those, like, for example, uh, I don't know which country to to mention, but for example, uh, France is, is you know till now, according to the numbers, is giving only zero point zero two percent. So what's what what kind of argument should we use? You know, how to convince them? Yeah, this is a good and an important question. Obviously, I, I'm an I'm an official, a hundred percent apolitical. But just so that all the listeners understand. This week, all of Estonia, all of our teachers are protesting because of salaries. Uh, but nobody is questioning uh, the requirement for defense investment. Uh, what I'm trying to say is there is a good recognition also here at the MOD in Estonia that there will always be a differences. There will always be differences in our threat perception. It will, it will never change. Uh, geography does matter, uh, and we recognize uh, all of that. Now, a simple answer, and this ties to the strike of the teachers, is uh, we should be very good about teaching history uh, to our uh, to our publics. Hopefully, we are doing it and explaining it. But what I really mean is, most of our leaders uh, have to demonstrate leadership and have to communicate to their publics. There is not a single uh, capital in Europe, at least that I've seen, where there are people on the street protesting against uh, uh, giving too much uh, financial support uh, for Ukraine. There is, yes, a fluctuation of that support, uh, but overall, all of the leaders are committed to supporting Ukraine. Overall, the public support uh, remains high or medium high across Europe, uh, bar from you know some countries or some leaders, etc. And critically, uh, most of the editorial boards of the most important newspaper outlets, pundits, and so forth, are invested in this war in the sense of that everyone believes in the in the importance of uh, this uh, war. So uh, there is no magic formula. There is no magic tool per se or silver bullet that is going to solve this. It, it's going to be a continuous discussion. And uh, what I will say is uh, the reason we put out this paper as well is that everyone has access to it. Everyone can read this. And it's understandable because it's a government agency that has put this out and this message spreads and people are interested they are interested in understanding 
what is the real cost of war and what are the real consequences of war. And we need to be doing that job in explaining the threat really well to our publics. It's a lot easier in Estonia, but it's not, we still have to make good arguments, but good arguments alone do not make a good story. We need a good story uh, as well. And of course, President Zelensky himself, his team, uh, and a lot of his friends and allies have, have, done, a, uh, have done a great job in, in that regard. We need to continue doing exactly that. And coming back to that, uh, that leaders meeting, that 0 0.25, that is a powerful mes message to the publics. Even if there are concerns, uh, whatever country that might be, that leader can say, but all of Europe is doing this. All of the other leaders are doing this. Uh, we have to do this to be part of that community. It's a simple message. Everyone understands that uh, fundamentally. So thanks. Thanks, Christian. Uh, well, maybe, you know, I don't know to whom, to Linus or to Christian or to... Uh, everybody, you know, I have then my own one question, but it relates to what Christian have said, and then it relates to, you know, to what some other questions are, are speaking about. Well, if you look into, again, Christian, into your paper, so uh, I would say, okay, you showed, you know, the winning strategy, or how Americans, you know, Republicans are saying uh, when they are demanding uh, some some strong action from from Democrats and from the administration, they are calling it credible plan for victory and arm uh, Ukraine. You know? I mean, clear plan. So we, you are showing, you know, what is needed for the victory. My question is very simple. So if we have the plan, so how much such a plan can become, uh, for example, a joint plan of NATO, of EU? I mean, when we are speaking about deliveries, it looks what I was listening to Linus, you know, that countries are giving something voluntarily, what they're giving, you know. Some countries are giving 1% or more, some countries are giving 0.02%. And then the question is, you know, if on one side we have, you know, what is needed for the victory, on another side we do not know who is really delivering. I mean, there is no such kind of very clear plan that those needs which uh, which we see in the victory plans as they will be covered. Or I'm wrong, or maybe there is some kind of secret plan, Rammstein or NATO or EU plan, which you know is is uh, how to say somewhere 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 elaborated, but we do not know about that. And that and and for me to know that there is a plan how to deliver would bring you know uh, much more of confidence that really we are, we are ready to win. So what's about, you know, we need, we, we know the needs, but we don't know who will cover those needs, if I'm, I am correct or not. Uh, Christian and Zanlinas, maybe. Oh, there are clearly limits to what I can say as a defense official uh, coming from uh, Estonia. But what I will say is that uh, Chancellor Schultz has definitely put out a very strong message to a lot of European countries and leaders uh, in that regard. And clearly this is going to uh, uh, create a, an atmosphere for the upcoming defense ministers meeting, but also for the European Council meeting as well. Uh, obviously this is, this is a strong uh, statement in, in that regard. Um, in terms of uh, the um, uh, transparency or understanding of what exactly everyone uh, is giving and the overall discussion of what level of equipment, uh, whether it's new, old, large or small, uh, what I would say is all of these pieces would fall into place pretty easily, relatively easily. Uh, if there is a common agreement on what we want to achieve on the battlefield, there is a lot of military planning and has been done, you know, in, in Wiesbaden uh, for, for prepping the offensives and, and, you know, most likely preparing for defensive operations this year and so forth. 
So all of that is ongoing. And there are, of course, capability uh, coalitions uh, as part of the Rammstein coalition as well, targeting those very specific uh, military capabilities. There are lead nations and so forth. So a lot of work is, is being done already. The, the real question is that the work to do what? What to achieve what? Once we have uh, once we have that answer, and we have the means, the resource commitment as well, the pieces will fall into place. There is there, there is not a lack of uh, smart military thinkers in the alliance. Uh, I have no doubt in in that. It starts from leadership. Thanks. Okay, thanks a lot, Linus. Can you join? You know, of course. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Indeed, if I may just build up on what was just said. Um, actually, what is also a positive in a way, at least uh, speaking about EU institutions, is that there is no need anymore to explain to anyone about the threats, the war, the possible damages, consequences, etc. At least now, speak, speaking as Lithuanian, you know, we have this uh, also uh, uh, responsibility in a way to explain certain uh, men mentality issue related uh, to, to Russians and to their behavior and their understanding of the world. Now we don't need, don't need to do this anymore. So it is very much understood by all levels at EU level. This is a very positive thing. So at least here we don't waste any more our time. <clears throat> but then uh, there is indeed kind of still, um, seems there is also no, no lack of money. Uh, money is now everywhere in each and every country because we have also economic prosperity and then also budgets are increasing, defense budgets. There is no problem speaking about the money. Also, uh, there is political also consensus among all in a way to, 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 to proceed and to try to find the ways how to support Ukraine to the maximum extent possible. Also, there is no problem. Uh, and I don't now give a solution or the answer, but uh, what was stunning for us for sure was that also when we initiated all together this three track initiative and out of 27 countries, which uh, called for procurement of 1 million rounds of ammunition, only I, I count 12, in total, but lead nations, so seven which procured through EDA, and then I count more or less max maybe 11, 12, which placed orders as a lead nations again, Germany, you know, Sweden with uh, Finland and Norway, and others <clears throat> um, separately. And this is good, it doesn't matter whether you go through NATO, EDA, or through lead nations, but it's very little. And this is uh, really uh, raises a lot of questions what is happening. Maybe you can say that probably uh, they are also delivering many other things to Ukraine, and this is why they cannot you know, devote all resources only to ammunition. That also could be one of the reasons, by the way. Um, but again, what is clear and one of the lessons learned probably that this one million in one year, you cannot impose. And you cannot impose without having very concrete and also a, a commitment or agreement between the customer and the supplier. So I mean member states and industry. And that was one of the also issues that uh, first we committed something and then we realized that industry either is fully booked because I, the reason I mentioned, because of exports, industry are private entities, um, not all, but uh, most of them, by the way. And they also very much survive from the exports. So it, it must be, it can be even 50% above, even less, depending on the types of, 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 of capabilities, but they depend, their revenues depend on, on, on export. So this has to be also taken taken into account, and they cannot simply drop everything, decline, you know, reject because they have penalties, uh, etc. So this is also uh, the market how it operates. So we have always to take this into account. However, <clears throat> uh, despite mentioning all these positive elements which are there, what is uh, probably helping and it helps if at least through EPF, and that's already my assessment that for sure having additional extra EU money because again European Union is not a customer. We don't owe capabilities that we can procure and then deliver to Ukraine. Neither commission, by the way. Commission is not like the United States. You cannot compare us with the United States because the United States is the one which is uh, placing the order, the procuring and doing in a way they, they wish uh, in the operations or donating to, to the partner countries. Here, only member states can procure, not EDA or commission. So EPF with the additional financial incentive was really something that triggered this at least those countries that we have now, I mentioned about 12, which um, came together and they placed orders. 
I don't know. Maybe even without EPF, they would be cooperating together. But I think that helps for sure. And now what is happening, and maybe it's known for many because it was also media that uh, EU is uh, very seriously considering now building on this success additional Ukrainian assistance fund, which would be much, much bigger than EPF in the past and only to support Ukraine. Yes, there are some very difficult political debates and discussions ongoing in the council primarily. And uh, again, I will not go into details on this, but, but if that format of Ukraine assistance fund would be agreed and would be launched and now i think it's also in the hands of the heads of states on the, in the beginning of february i understand to to come to conclusion not only on this of course but on the bigger envelope to support ukraine i speak about 50 billion euro that would be a big game changer why <clears throat> because in this case we get money cash in a way that we spend for procurement here and now and then we deliver to ukraine actually this is what we need because ukraine cannot wait for this as we say mid to long term investments and uh, and this is very important in terms of the technological advancements vis-a-vis -vis our also partners in the in us but also in the southeast asia but speaking about ukraine we need to act in very very short term right now and to cooperate with industry because without industry we cannot deliver and supply so i think uh, well again financial incentives help so i support very much again to continue financial self incentives and also to engage with industry from the outset and to have an agreement with them. Again, we cannot have agreement, but they have to be involved. Agreement can be reached only when you sign the contract, but uh, they have to be involved. Uh, let's hope that the strategy that which is now being drafted will also support. But again, I know that the strategy is aiming for, again, next 10, 15 years. It's not for this year or next year. So a bit, uh, it's going beyond uh, our perimeter, but we need to engage industry, and industry is ready to engage as well, by the way, uh, if they see uh, serious signals and commitments from member states to place orders. But we need orders. Okay, good. Ariana, I see the question, uh, can you elaborate a little bit more about Canada and, uh, and how Canada is uh, supporting Ukraine? And maybe you can, you know, well, since Canada is next to the United States, maybe you can explain what will happen when President, uh, when when uh, Donald Trump will win presidential elections, and what to do in general with U.S. you know assistance, which is uh, really, as Urmas have said, you know, is not coming. You are still un unmute yourself. Sorry, um, I I'll summarize it. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to jump into the delve into the nitty gritty of it because it's it's too timely and. and really besides the point. Um, the support is insufficient and the commitment is uh, too vague. Um, and I think that um, Canada should and could be taking a much stronger leadership role on certain issues. For example, uh, championing the International uh, Special Tribunal and trying to pressure our American colleagues to see the wisdom um, of having one and the dangers of not implementing one, despite their obvious objections, because they don't want to be held to account uh, for some of their own past actions. Um, uh, I don't. I, I don't know how um, a Trump victory will affect uh, Canada. I know how it'll affect Ukraine. It'll be a disaster, but it'll be a disaster for the world. Um, uh, the degree of support in Canada um, is more likely to be affected by upcoming uh, elections, uh, federal elections. Um, and, you know, I, the, the polls are, are not so promising, but I don't, I, I don't, I really don't want to speak about the, those domestic matters. It's, um, I think what needs to be done at a very, very high level um, uh, and yes, I, I agree with what Christian said about the messaging having to come from leaders, but the leaders need to be, more leaders need to be um, uh, compelled to understand that the threat 
to uh, that Russia poses to Ukraine is not limited to Ukraine and that the war against Ukraine is not merely about Ukraine. It's about upending the entire international Western order um, and that Ukrainian loss is our collective loss and Ukrainian victory is our collective victory. And I think that um, the, the understanding that Russia poses a threat to the Western world simply is lacking. Perhaps it's well understood in Lithuania or Estonia, Latvia, but that's based on history and geography. The proximity is there. I was just trying to look up, I, I can't recall exactly when it was, I, I think it may have perhaps been in the summer, that um, even NATO warned that um, Russia poses a direct military threat to Canada via the Arctic. Um, if Russia isn't defeated in Ukraine, it's not just a problem for Ukraine, it's a problem for Canada, for the United States, for everywhere. Um, and I think that if, if individual nations, if the people of individual nations are helped um, to understand the, the urgency of defeating Russia, then I think that we might see more pressure on our leaders to um, well, demand resolute action. Um, I saw that there were a couple of questions about the fear of escalation. Um, and and I, I simply reject this. I know it's a very dominant um, concern in, in the rhetoric, but the, the thing is, what we see is the opposite. There is a clear historical pattern that when Russia is not dealt with resolutely, it invites aggression. And we just see the building from Chech the uh, war on Chechnya on. Um, it's only if someone finally puts their foot down and stops them and defeats them that we can see the, the risk of escalation decrease. Because right now we're on an extraordinarily dangerous path. I mean, I know that's understood on this panel. Um, but beyond that, um, I don't think that messaging is clear. I think that for most people, it's still understood to be some territorial conflict. Um, uh, as for concerns about what might happen um, if the Russian Federation disintegrates, uh, collapses, well, I, I think those fears are misplaced, and I think they are the same types of fears that people had about the collapse of the USSR. Um, you know, there's there's such a thing as controlled collapse, and one of the many ways to help prevent uh, an uncontrolled chaotic collapse uh, is to start supporting heavily, supporting the uh, leaders of the national liberation movements within the Russian Federation. So, um, but the, the biggest thing is that I, I feel very, very strongly that it is not understood that this war is not just about Ukraine, and that if if it loses, if Ukraine loses, it's it's an escalation, <laughs> it's an escalatory loss, and we are all at risk. I don't think that's understood, um, and I think that really needs to be conveyed to more decision makers um, and to ordinary people, so they can pressure their their governments and uh, heads of state to take appropriate action. Thanks a lot, Ariana. Now, I saw uh, some questions uh, which uh, were very similar, and maybe Urmas, since uh, you have uh, all those you know, portfolios in your experience. Uh, the question is about, uh, is it possible that the West will decide to fully confiscate all those you know, 300 billion uh, Russian frozen assets? Uh, I don't know if you are following that discussion. Uh, you know, there are some 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 developments. Americans now are starting to push more heavily for G7. You know, and we are trying to do some some discussions here in the European Parliament. But maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that. You know, where how you how you see you know what uh, what can happen. I I, I believe that uh, the EU will reach to the conclusions where the interests. Uh, will be taken into use. I don't know, it's annually some billions. So this is a minimum consensus. And surely uh, some countries, some countries' investors, they are afraid of the uh, symmetrical response from uh, Russia, from Russian Central Bank. And there are still vast investments from Western Hemisphere in Russian soil. Also the Central Banks have made their future uh, investments uh, and uh, so this is a, a sad reality but I, I think our joint task is indeed to encourage that but basically this amount will cover in a way uh, uh, the by and large uh, let's say 
two years military effort. Uh, um, so um, I think what is very important is now to still, uh, I would like to stress, the situation is critical. And uh, we have to, to put the priorities. We, we have the Western Hem community has a certain comprehensive approach of resistance, um, accountability, uh, the uh, reconstruction of Ukraine, many other things, support of the sustainability of Ukrainian society. But I think the vital, the existential element is now a joint effort of uh, military uh, support. And uh, there are many excuses which are rather objective on the logistical uh, uh, scene, particularly on production of uh, ammunition. But let uh, me put to that perspective. EU, in a combined manner, uh, produced last year more than 10 million cars. And we are still unable, uh, in a year perspective, to produce 1 million shells, which are rather more primitive uh, things. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Urmas. So, yeah, we are coming uh, to the end of our conversation. I don't know if uh, anybody wants to jump in from our speakers uh, to say a few, few comments, you know, before the end. If not, then I will try to summarize, you know, in a, in a very, uh, you know, short way. Because there was one question about forthcoming European Parliament elections, and since I am ready to run again so i i can i can try to you know to uh, to tell how i see what political messages really we need to have and uh, maybe we can look into the possibility that european parliament elections will be good opportunity for political parties to exactly to elaborate on that and uh, I will start from what Ariana was speaking and everybody else here around perhaps were speaking. What is needed really, it's uh, first of all, it's uh, for for political parties, for the leaders in, in Europe, you know, and also in the whole Western democratic world to upgrade their language. And definitely we can agree that all that language which was used till now that, you know, we shall stand with Ukraine, uh, as long as it takes, it's not enough. We can hear from some uh, leaders, yes, we are you know, uh, standing with Ukraine till Ukraine will win, but I haven't heard at least very clear language, uh, you know, in addition to that, that we shall stand with Ukraine till Ukraine will win and Russia will be defeated. And this is some kind of psychological, you know, uh, still red line in the mind of you know the western political leaders to speak about the need of russia to be defeated you know is still here so we need really mm, uh, try to speak out why that is very much needed uh, one thing is really that russia is a permanent danger and if you know russia will not be defeated and the changes will not come into russia then russia will stay as a, as a permanent danger to us Sometimes I am uh, quoting, you know, I'm reminding uh, Roosevelt and, and Churchill uh, Declaration 1943 in Casablanca, how they announced uh, that their goal in the war is uh, full defeat of, of uh, Hitler. An explanation was, you know, you can change just, you know, uh, name of, 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 uh, of a dictator, you know, from Hitler to Putin and uh, from from Germany to Nazi Germany to Russia, all that language of Roosevelt was very good uh, for for today. His language, he was saying that, look, uh, uh, we cannot go for ceasefire or some kind of peace agreement with uh, Hitler because it will mean that uh, after a few years he will come again with new force. And defeat of uh, Nazi Germany does not mean defeat of, of German nation. It means defeat of Nazi ideology. And that is needed that after the war, uh, Germany would be able to recover as a normal democracy. And for us, for the West, that would be the goal, you know, in general, to, to assist Russia to become a normal country. And that can be achieved only through Ukrainian victory, you know, with an assistance of the West. So that's what, what I see as a, some kind of clear political message which the Western leaders need to be 
not afraid to 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 speak out. And I do I absolutely agree with Ariana about you know how the weakness is 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 uh, provoking you know escalation of Putin and how our strengths could could exactly have an opposite um, opposite uh, consequences. Second, at least you know myself as well. Um, uh, maybe I I don't know everything, but I would like to see really what Americans are saying, credible plan for victory, what I see in, in a stone and paper, what is needed for the victory. You know? uh, but it's it should be agreed among the Western uh, community. That should be not an individual approach that Estonians have their plan, what is needed, we have our plan, no, or somebody else have, but it should be agreed and approved by you know either NATO or European Union or EU and US, you know, in a separate way, what is needed for the victory and for defeat of Russia. And that would be very that should be very concrete. How much of shells are needed, how much of you know, I don't know, rhymers or whatever, you know, are needed. And then here should be also from from our side very clear plan how we are going to deliver. What kind of you know industries we need to expand in which countries, uh, you know, and how we shall finance through this you know coalition of zero point twenty five percent, but that should be again a great plan how to deliver, and and that is that should be you know two sides of the same uh, plan for victory in Ukraine. So it sounds very <laughs> simple and very and very you know easy to achieve, but it looks like that it's not so easy. So that is why really we shall continue our efforts and and definitely you know uh, victory of ukraine is is of absolute uh, geopolitical priority for all of us that is uh, what uh, what is needed not only for ukraine it's needed for our region it's needed for the whole europe it's needed for the whole world so thanks a lot to everybody you know thanks a lot for uh, you know speakers to speakers thanks a lot for all the audience, we shall continue, you know, our our webinars and we shall continue our political, real political fights, you know, based on good, you know, papers from the experts uh, to convince, you know, all, all, all the all the leaders, all the governments, all the, you know, institutions in EU and NATO to do what is needed to be done. Thanks a lot and good luck. Thank, Thank you. you.